I strongly recommend all of you to follow these. I am sure that these uh, talks would greatly help in day-to-day -day clinical practice. As one of the course directors of the SGI Endoscopy Masterclass, I would like to invite all of you to join us for the first episode which will be broadcasted live on the 28th of November, Saturday in the evening from 4.30 to 6.00 pm. The SGI Endoscopy Masterclass, the first season will span from end of November till March and it will cover 8 episodes and each episode which will be brought to you by the endoscopy masters of our country will be in the form of video lectures and the topics which will be covered are image enhanced endoscopy, endoscopic resection techniques, selective cannulation of the bile duct, cholangioscopy, endoscopic ultrasonography, poor oral endoscopic myotomy the technique and the intraoperative management of complications and endotherapy of variceal and non-variceal bleeding and endotherapy of gastroesophageal reflux disease. So I look forward to joining all of you on the 28th of November for the first episode of the first season of the SGI Endoscopy Masterclass on Saturday in the evening from 4.30 to 6.00. Endoscopy masterclasses being planned by Society of GI Endoscopy of India would be different from the usual web classes. There will be interesting video lectures followed by panel discussion and there will be enough time for question answer sessions. The topics which have been chosen for these masterclasses will be of great clinical importance. Dear friends, Society of GI Endoscopy of India is starting master class in endoscopy. These master classes are aimed at providing a practical information about the technique and technology regarding diagnostic and therapeutic endoscopy and how to manage endoscopically various GI disorders. And these classes will be held twice a month and each class will be 90 minutes. And I request all of you to attend these master classes and benefit from them. Good evening friends, welcome to the SGI master class season one episode three. I am Matthew Flew, president of SGI. I bring in greetings from Society of Gastrins and Endoscopy of India. On behalf of SGI, I wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. 2020 was a challenging year for the whole world and we hope we will have a better time in 2021 with the COVID vaccine around. SGI Masterclass is committed to provide learning of various aspects of major diagnostic and therapeutic GI endoscopy. Today, a very important area of endoscopy, that is the RCP, is being discussed in a learning format. We have pioneer speakers in this field and very eminent panelists and chairpersons to discuss the various issues. I appreciate and thank the course directors and coordinators who work very hard for the success of this webinar. The previous webinars were well attended and well appreciated. May I request now the Secretary General of SGI, Professor Sandeep Lakthakia, to take over and start the proceedings by introduction of the speakers and panelists. Thank you. Mr. So, President, thank you, Mr. Matthew Philip. And uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the third edition or third episode of the Masterclass. Today we have uh, uh, real masters uh, in the session today. Uh, and the session today is on ERCP. And the basics of ERCP is how to enter the duct that you want to enter. That is either the bile duct or the pancreatic duct. And we can't have uh, better speakers than what we have today. And the session would be conducted by stalwarts themselves. May I invite Dr. G. N. Ramesh and Praveer Rai to conduct the session for today. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Sandeep. Thank you very much, Dr. Matthew Philip and a warm good evening to you all. Well, a great privilege to be the, the co-anchor for this session. As has been mentioned before, the theme for this masterclass is selective CBD and pancreatic cannulation. I don't think so. It could be get more basic than this. And 
this is something that is going to be very important for not only the beginners also for those who are trying to improve their ERCT techniques and we have four masters to address four video lectures four aspects about the basics of cantilation well we'll start off with the first video lecture and the this first video lecture is slightly different as you all know that it is very important that our reporting system should be watertight and uh, we have dr praveer rai who is the professor of gastroenterology at sgpgi lucknow with more than 50 articles to his credit three chapters 150 invited lectures who's also an associate editor of the world journal of gi endos gastrointestinal endoscopy and also on the editorial board of journal of digestive endoscopy and a governing council member of the national society the sgi as well dr praveer is going to tell us about minimum standard reporting for ercp a few housekeeping rules before we start with this lecture number 1 anyone who would like to ask a question please feel free to send it in it will be put on the chat box and i can assure you that it will be addressed during the course of this master class of course to my co panelists i please request you to if you are not speaking please unmute yourself and please also put off your video so that the quality of transmission is much better so with these few words let me now first of all invite professor praveer rai to talk on minimum standard reporting for ercp dr praveer the time allotted is 8 minutes this will be followed by 7 minutes of discussion over to you dr praveer uh thank you dr ramesh uh, i would like to thank sgi for providing me this opportunity am i audible yes you are audible yes you are audible okay so i'll be talking about minimum standard reporting for ercp so this is not a video lecture because it's just how to report an ercp so i'll be touching about the basics what makes a report good report and how it should be reported so an accurate ercp report is an indispensable element of a successful procedure it's crucial for referring doctor and has practical administrative and legal applications a good structured report besides findings per se it should include other aspects of the procedure from techniques formal technical and the medical so it has got some components and these components are need to be arranged in a specific order i'll come to those and for reporting findings what we have is a minimum standard terminology this is a term which every one of us need to be aware of this offers a framework for description of lesion so it offers a limited number of code terms that can be used to describe the most frequent finding a number of required attributes with possible attribute values are presented for each term or lesion i'll come to it what i mean by this so the principle of minimum standard terminology is to describe findings objectively by the visual characteristic without adding interpretation of endoscopist so in addition other report items like indications procedures adverse events are also structured in a similar way so this is not comprehensive but it offers a suggestion of key elements for describing findings it is helpful Yes, I can't hear you. There is, there is something wrong. No, it's okay. No, it's okay. So we can develop a software for all findings. Need to have a location attribute to show. So once we talk of the biliary tree or a major papilla, we need to be shown from the papilla if we are talking of a specific lesion in the bile duct. The other minimum standard terminology include the cystic duct, cystic duct takeoff, gallbladder, bifurcation, the hilum, left hepatic duct. right hepatic duct 
And when we talk of left and right hepatic duct, we need to talk of whether we are talking of central or the peripheral duct, then the left intrahepatic or the right intrahepatic branches or the segmental branch. So once we talk of the pancreatic duct, again, we need to be sure we are talking of pancreatic duct at the major papilla, minor papilla, the whole pancreatic duct, and once we are talking of a stricture or a stone located in the pancreatic duct, we need to mention the site where exactly it's located, head, neck, body, tail, or the uncinate process, whether it's a ventral duct, dorsal duct, duct of Centaurini, duct of Wiedsung, or we are talking of side branches. We need to mention about distance from the papilla. We need to mention whether it's a whole duct we are talking of or a select portion of the pancreatic duct, and whether it's a central or a peripheral part of the pancreatic duct. So this figure becomes very important. This is I think the video has paused. What we see when we do a cholangiogram there's something wrong with this. Uh, You're fine now. Dynamics is a problem, I think, Praveer. Mahesh? Yeah, I, can, uh, I cannot see. I cannot hear you. Left duct, you should be aware of. We have segmentation. If there is a stone or a stick, there is a... What happened? Ravir, what happened? You need to share your screen again, I think. Yeah, I think the connection was lost for a minute from Dr. Pravir Rai's end. Uh, uh, it's okay. So, yeah. no, it's okay, Pravir, okay. carry on. Can you continue? continue. Okay. So, if you're talking of right anterior, right posterior duct, posterior duct again is formed by the segment 6 and segment 7. So, this needs to come into the report when we are talking of these. Again, if we are talking of papilla, we need to be sure what exactly the location, appearance and the output. Location can be normal, high, low, whether it's intradiverticular or the edge of the diverticulum. Appearance, whether it's normal, hidden or small. Adenomatous, filtrated or congested. Previous EPT, fistulotomy or sphincterplasty or previous ampullectomy if it is done. You need to mention about output that is seen when we visualize the papilla, that's bile, pus, debris, blood or mucin. Again, when we talk of divism, we need to mention it, whether it's complete or incomplete. When we talk of common channel, especially in carcinoma gallbladder, we need to mention about the length of the common channel, what millimeters it is. If we've talked about hepatic duct normally, we need to mention about its type. Again, when we see a ductal pathology in the pancreatic duct or the bile duct, we need to mention about irregularity if it is present, whether it's localized or generalized. Dilatation if it is present, we need to mention about type, whether again it's localized cystic or generalized pre-stenotic. When we talk about stricture, we need to mention about what's the length of the stricture, what's the degree of the stricture, that is whether it's moderate, whether it's passable by a catheter, passable by a wire, or it cannot be passed by a wire or a catheter, then whether it's extrinsic or intrinsic. If you see stones, we need to mention about the number, single or multiple size of the stones, and whether they're obstructing or not. If you see a tumor, then we need to mention about type, localized, diffuse, obstructing, whether it's complete or partial obstructing, and bismuth classification if we have malignancy. Again, ductal pathology, if we see a leak, we need to mention about degree, whether it's small, moderate, or large. If we have stent which is being placed, we need to mention about whether it's a straight stent or it's a pigtail stent, how many stents are being placed, and if the stent has migrated inward or outward, we need to mention that. Filling defects, if you see, we need to mention whether it's possible sludge, air bubble, parasite, mucus, protein flux, or cast, and if the patient has underwent prior surgery. So when we talk of pancreatic or biliary cannulation, we need to mention whether it was attempted, whether it is incidental, superficial, deep, or failed. If we are talking about opacification of the bile duct or the pancreatic duct, we need to mention whether it was complete, incomplete, or it was not intended. Again, about papliotomy, we need to mention about type, excess, pre-cut, or therapeutic, the wire knife or needle knife which was used, specifically for pile duct, pancreatic duct, or for both. 
if you are using a dilating balloon or a boogie dilatation we need to mention the caliber of the dilator and the result which is achieved post dilatation stone the method used for fragmentation of the stone whether it was achieved or not and result whether it was complete clearance partial clearance or a questionable clearance if we talk of stent removal the methods which we use for stent removal if we talk of hemostasis in the biliary system again we use clips balloon compression apc or coagulation so the report should include the administrative data so that was all the minimal standard terminology that we use with this what we achieved is a report which should include administrative data that is endoscopic facility patient identifier date time location endoscopic procedure elective or the emergent procedure inpatient or outpatient endoscopist endoscopic nurse anesthetist referring doctor clinical data again becomes very important that is indication of the reason for endoscopy brief history including relevant family history we need to mention about asa score presence of comorbidities whether consent was achieved or not it's very important to be mentioned for medical legal purpose technical information again sedation and drugs that have been used equipment used the quality of cleaning and visualization extent of the examination that was intended and that was achieved technical or the procedural aspects as i have highlighted patient comfort in the sedation quality that was used doodle intubation and pertinent luminal findings the procedural detail cannulation details and x-rays used dactrographic findings whether we find strictures stones in the ducts sampling whether that was done or not and therapeutic procedures that was performed so in the end of this report we need to have a summary and recommendation the score information the procedure including the diagnostic and therapeutic aspect of the ERCP and then result recommendation should include monitoring if needed repeat procedure or other follow up if needed another very imp important aspect of report is the presence of images which is radiological image and endoscopic image again very very important we should achieve a image during initial cannulation of the scope for this we need to remove all foreign bodies when we take an x-ray image initial contrast injection may, must be very accurately recorded to delineate the biliary anatomy or reveal leaks or small stones at this point of time if we, we are not cautious we may make miss small stones or miss small leaks complete filling of the pertinent ductal system using balloon relevant phases of therapeutic maneuver should be shown on the x-ray image any adverse event like presence of air if it happens or impacted basket may well be documented on the x-ray image final image should be taken after removing the endoscope about endoscopic image any pathology or aberration should be captured images of papilla before and after treatment important phase of therapy and a video recording is done after this you can have a handwritten report which is usually not preferred and it's usually endoscopy reporting software that is used commonly so this is the asg which has mentioned about the components of the endoscopy report that need to be present in all ercp report and these are as we have already discussed so to summarize endoscopy report is the main tool to document the ercp procedure and the result structuring the report and including compulsory items facilitates quality assurance and helps track the performance structured reporting based on minimum standard terminology and standard definition helps to develop a common language improves readability of the report image documentation is crucial to ercp and this image standardization and there should be communication with the radiologist for the radiographic image thank you thank you very much uh, uh, dr praveer we have about 3 minutes for uh, uh, three or four minutes for question answers uh, i'll set the ball rolling i have got uh, two or three questions from the chat box as well the first question which i would like to ask you is who should report and sign the document it is a medical legal document who is it that should do it Uh, sorry sir i didn't get the question who who is responsible or who should be writing out or uh, typing out the report and who should be signing the report Number so report uh, obviously should be signed by the uh, gastroenterologist who is doing the procedure he needs to sign the report obviously after reading because of the paucity of time obviously there is a technician who prints types the report which has to be signed by the person who performs it on a very lighter side are there any studies which have actually looked at how many of our reports are complete so i don't think we have but uh, uh, i went through around 8 to 10 different uh, reports from different centers 
and uh, including my center and i would say that uh, almost all were incomplete so a lot of improvement to be done yeah sandeep lakthakia asks what is the preferred term dorsal duct or minor duct matthew philip also asks should not should we not refer to them as duct of versing and duct of sanctuary so i think uh, there is a lot of confusion about this but i think if you go to basic uh, basic anatomy there should not be any confusion duct of sanctorini just points out to the minor duct that is coming to the minor papilla that is duct of sanctorini the main pancreatic the ventral duct is the duct of virsa so usually if we are talking of a main if we talk of main pancreatic duct we can mention the site where exactly it is located tail head body tail genu uh, where exactly it is located so duct of sanctorini is the minor duct which joins to the minor drain to the minor papilla that is the duct of sanctorini duct of wiedsang is the ventral duct so that is duct of wiedsang so 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 probably it may be more logical to avoid these names because they create confusion and just refer to them as dorsal duct and ventral duct any of my other co panelists would like to raise a question or a comment with respect to this particular presentation what about the biliary system in the biliary system should we mention which segmental duct is involved or you think that's not so important even if you say anterior right anterior right posterior that's sufficient yeah so i think in specific scenarios it may be a bit different because if we talk of bile leak because we get some patients with bile leak there it sometimes uh, may be important to delineate the particular segment what we are talking of if we see the leak there of but i think in majority we see the leak at the side of the cystic duct to the right main hepatic duct to the left main hepatic duct however if there is a aberrant biliary anatomy then only we see some specific segments of the duct which becomes important to mention when we are doing a cholangiogram at that point of uh, uh, praveer uh, rapid fire questions because i need to finish this in one minute suppose a fellow is doing ercp who should sign sorry sir suppose a fellow is doing the ercp hmm. who should sign the document <sighs> uh i think uh, uh, it it again depends whether it is supervised or not if it is supervised the consultant should sign rather than the fellow if it is an independent one then the fellow can sign okay now many think, of these uh, patients i can i can interrupt there gn yeah. i think it yeah. all depends on the credentialing policy of your hospital if your hospital has given a credentialing power to a fellow to perform an ercp then he can sign but if the credentialing is lying with the consultant and then the fellow consultant i know. i agree with you uh, now many of these patients are observed for some period during in the endoscopy suite itself in in the observation area should the report also include the post procedure events that have happened in the observation area or should it be a part of the progress notes i think uh, any complication that happens during or just immediately after the procedure because we come to notice immediately after the procedure that should be mentioned in the report itself for sure okay uh now thank you very much praveer that was very crisp very useful and very informative at least i hope a lot of us would take back important messages and the most important message is we have to improve on our reporting okay now next we go on to uh, a series of uh, lectures by the masters themselves and um, the first of these refers to selective bile duct cannulation and sphincterotomy by dr mahesh goenka we all know that dr mahesh goenka is the chief gastroenterologist and the director of digestive disease sciences at uh, apollo glenicles hospital kolkata more importantly something that we many of us know some of us probably don't know He is the governor of the Assist, uh, American College of Gastroenterology for India since 2017. Recently decorated with the award of leadership in uh, in gastroenterology by the American College itself, and also the editor in chief of the Journal of Digestive Endoscopy. Dr. Mahesh Goenka is going to cover a lot of area, and this is very important for the 
people who are starting ERCP or those who are doing ERCP as well, with special emphasis on positioning of the scope, as well as maneuvering the scope and uh, also the sphincter toe, how to get the CBD axis right, and also a few important techniques to get a good CBD cannulation. Over to you, Mahesh, for your presentation, which is 12 minutes. Thank you, GN, and good evening, everybody. Uh, as you said, this particular talk is mainly for the beginners, but I'm sure some of us can take up some tips here and there. Uh, I would start by saying that selective bile duct cannulation is a rate limiting step, possibly the most important step for BDL endotherapy. If we can achieve a high rate of selective bile duct cannulation and that too fast, I think we are not only increasing our efficiency of doing BDL endotherapy, but decreasing the complication rate, whether it's pancreatitis, bleeding or perforation. I must start by saying that a class like this cannot actually train somebody for cannulation. Better options are to practice on simulator, attending workshop, and possibly the best option is to perform an ERCP in the endoscopy room in presence of your mentor. Having said that, let me give you a few tips about selective biliary cannulation. In principle, with our concept of these being these masterclasses being step to step, step by step approach, I have arbitrarily divided them into five steps. Step one is normal cannulation technique. Step two is change technique due to anatomical reasons. Step three is change technique because of some events happening during cannulation. Step four is failed cannulation at ERCP and you resort to pre-cut. And the step five is then when you declare a failed ERCP and look for alternate modalities, which can be US, percutaneous, rendezvous, or repeat an ERCP later on. So in this talk, I will only cover the step one, step two, and step three. Step four will be covered by Amit subsequently, and step five in subsequent episodes. So let me talk about normal cannulation technique. As Ramesh rightly said, I think the prerequisite is that you properly position an endoscope, correct approach to the papilla in terms of direction, and use appropriate accessories. There are the three positions of the endoscope. This is almost a straight scope. This is a long route, and this is a semi-long route. In general, in most of the time, we would prefer this particular one, a semi-long route, because if this gives a stability to your scope, it won't fall back into the stomach repeatedly and increases the maneuverability of your various accessories. But I must admit that in about 5 to 10% of the time, even in the expert hands, because of the duodenal anatomy or position of the papilla, you may require to do the endoscopy ERCP in the other two positions as well. Now, where do you position a scope? This is not the right way of positioning the scope. The endoscope tip must be close to the papilla and tip should be somewhat distal to the papilla, so-called tucked under position as demonstrated in the second picture. So don't try to cannulate in this position. Always look for a position like this to cannulate. So we must look at the anatomy before we talk about the approach. As we know that the bile duct in the lower part, the intradural part is somewhat S-shaped and these are the directions. So if you have to cannulate the bile duct, you should go almost parallel to the papilla and move in the direction of 10 to 11 o'clock position. Pancreatic duct, you approach more perpendicular and between one to two o'clock position. What are the devices? One can cannulate by various cannulas. You can use a sphincterotome, and of course, you'll need to use some guide wire sometime. In general, most of us, we start with a sphincterotome because it gives um, a freedom to move the direction of your approach, and it reduces the time of the procedure also. Among the guide wires, usually one with a hydrophilic wire tip is preferred for initial cannulation. This can be either a hybrid wire with the tip being hydrophilic but I prefer to start my procedures with a thermo wire more because of the cost rather than anything else. So the wire should be either 025 or 035. And in general, angle tip is preferred over the straight tip wire. So the next six uh, screens will show you some of the basic principles of ERCP. And these are very old slides, which, are, which I thought are very meaningful. So the first step is to engage yourself in 10 to 11 o'clock position. Like, like what I'm doing th in this particular picture. And then you flex your sphincterotome so that you overcome the septum which separates the pancreatic duct from the bile duct and you land up in the bile duct. And the step three, you withdraw the scope a few millimeters 
so that the tip of the sphincterotome falls into the cavity of the, the bile duct. I'm showing that in a short video. So what I'm trying to do is that I'm engaging with the sphincterotome at 10 to 11 o'clock position, planning to enter the bile duct. Then I'm taking the whole sphincterotome with a cutting wire outside the scope, flexing the cutting wire. And then once you have flexed the wire, you expect that you are already in the bile duct. And then you withdraw the scope a few millimeter, and then you will invariably land in the cavity of the bile duct. There's another technique which I wanted to demonstrate in this. This is called shoehorn technique. It's like when you have a tight shoes and you take help of a shoehorn. It's something like that. So I'm trying to engage into the papilla. And then once I'm engaged, I'm withdrawing the scope just like a shoehorn. And that will make me enter the bile duct, as you can see. And this can be a very, very useful technique sometimes. Now, whether to use a contrast in the beginning itself or to go with a guide wire. Most of us nowadays use a guide wire and you can manipulate the guide wire like this so that you enter the desired duct and I'm talking mainly about the bile duct. But sometimes when you have a difficulty, you may have to inject a small amount of contrast. But of course, that will increase somewhat a risk of pancreatitis if too much of contrast goes into the pancreatic duct. So what is difficult bile duct cannulation? There have been definite definitions, but ESGE, European Society, recently defined any cannulation in the bile duct which takes more than five minutes with more than five genuine attempts at the bile duct. And when there's more than once you have entered the pancreatic duct with contrast or cannulation, you should call it difficult cannulation. And difficult cannulation usually is there in the general practice in 10 to 30% of the cases. So that was step one of my deliberation. Step two is to how to change the technique due to altered anatomy. And there are many alterations in the anatomy, but I will touch upon only three. One is stenotic papilla or sometimes the everted papilla. That it means that the mucosa inside the bile duct has everted. And sometimes, though you can see the papilla very nicely, it may be very difficult to cannulate. Of course, we'll talk about diverticulum. So when you have a stenotic or everted papilla, it may be a good idea if you fail initially to take out two to three millimeter of the guide wire, hydrophilic wire, O35 is preferred. And then you probe with the papilla in and out of this scope. So Otherwise, with, the, with guide wire not being coming out, it may be difficult to enter the bile duct because the opening is very, very small because of either the everted mucosa or actually a stenotic papilla. So I would use a guide wire approach, guide wire first approach in this situation. So you touch the papilla first with a guide wire. Now let me talk about periampillary diverticulum. This is a difficult situation. We encountered periampillary diverticulum in about 10 to 15% of the patients. Sometimes it may be very easy when you have a diverticulum like this so that the papilla is located right in the center. I think it's very easy, sometimes easier than the normal uh, um, ERCP because the sphincter may be a little lax. Sometimes it may not be so easy. And this video will show you that, that I'm trying to cannulate with the normal sphincterotome. And my sphincterotome is not going. So I changed to a cannula. This is one situation where sometimes changing to cannula may help because the sphincterotome has a direction. And we know that in the presence of a diverticulum, the lower bile duct, the direction may not be as we expect in absence of diverticulum. So sometimes shifting to a cannula may be helpful in these situations. Now, it may be even more difficult. And some people will inject some substance at the, by the side of the papilla to make the papilla come out. One can use a few clips to bring the papilla out. But what I do in this technique, and I find to be very useful, is use a forcep technique. So what I do is that I'm trying to cannulate without using a forcep. The papilla is inside. So now I'm using a pediatric forcep to bring out the papilla. And as you can see, that the papilla has been brought out. And then by the side of this foreign body forcep, uh, sorry, uh, biopsy forcep, I'm passing a sphincterotome. So now the papilla is exposed. You can see the minor papilla here, just above the diverticulum. And by this technique, I was able to cannulate. And you can see the forcep here and the guide wire inside the bile duct. So this I find to be a very, very useful technique in some of the difficult periampillary diverticulum. Now, surgically altered anatomy is a chapter in itself. But then briefly, it can be Billroth. It can be Ruin Y. It can be pancreatic or duodenectomy. What scope to use will depend on what is the limb you're going to cross. If it's a short limb, you can use either a forward viewing gastroscope or a duodenoscope. But if it's going to be a long limb, then you should use an enteroscope. 
which can be double balloon or a single balloon endoscope. So this is a Billroth II, and this is a picture, which a video which I have taken from a case 16 years back from my archive. You can see that we have gone with a gastroscope, and I'm using a cannula in this case. Billroth II sphincterotome can be a good uh, accessory in this situation, but unfortunately they are hardly available now because Billroth II is now becoming very very obsolete type of surgery. So here I'm going with a cannula, able to cannulate. Then you put the guide wire. And then over the guide wire, you can change the other, other accessories. Sometimes it may be a challenge to find out whether you're dealing with afferent loop or efferent loop when you're approaching a loop. So in general, a loop closer to the lesser curve, one which is less straight, one you see bile in the loop is the one which is likely to the afferent loop. And you can use various types of cannulas. Of course, in this particular patient where there was a long limb after Roux and Y procedure, and I'm going with a balloon endoscope. Now there was an anastomosis like this also in this particular case. So when you have anastomosis like this, it's very easy to cannulate once you can reach there. And here we are directly going with a balloon, a sphincteroplasty balloon, and uh, dilate that opening, and then do whatever endotherapy you want to do. So here, reaching the papilla is more difficult, but once you reach the papilla, cannulating may not be so difficult. Now, step three is the anatomy is more or less norm normal, but some event happens during the RCP which requires change in the technique. And this can be either guide wire repeatedly entering pancreatic duct or a sphincterotome is piercing the papillary roof. So here you can see in the first video that my guide wire, this was the second or the third time that the guide wire went to the pancreatic duct. So I'm keeping the wire inside and going above the wire and then able to cannulate the bile duct, so-called double wire technique, and then do the procedure. Uh, I would make a comment that in this particular patient, a uh, few years back, I removed the guide wire from the pancreatic duct, which I usually won't do now with the literature which is available. And the second case uh, is a combination. So I'm using a forcep, a pediatric forcep to bring out in a presence of diverticulum. And then my guide wire enters the pancreatic duct. And then over the pent wire, I'm doing a sphincterotomy after introducing the sphincterotomy. So this is using a technique of forcep. So you can see I've used the forcep and the two wires, one in the PD and one in the CBD. I know that Dr. Amit Medev is going to cover pre-cut in detail, but just one slide when we are talking about double wire technique, that sometimes when you use a double wire, as in this case, you may not be able to cannulate the bile duct even after putting the wire in the pancreatic duct, as in this case. And in this situation, you may do a pre-cut over the wire. So what does this wire in the pancreatic duct do? It one, stabilizes the papilla. Number two, it straightens the intraduminal part of the bile duct. And number three, it prevents inadvertent entry in the pancreatic duct again and again. And I have found this procedure to be very, very useful. Now, this is another patient. Again, you can see that we have put a pancreatic stent in this case. And after putting the pancreatic stent, I could not still cannulate with the sphincterotome. So I have done a pre-cut. I'm sure Amit is going to talk more about pre-cut in the subsequent lecture. So I'm not talking much about it. So when you use this technique, there are a number of uh, initial studies. This is an old study about almost 12 years back. Success is about 73% with over the wire or over the stent. But a significant pancreatitis rate. And what they showed that if you put a PD stent, the risk of pancreatitis is much less than if you don't put a stent. Same thing brought out in the more recent study. So you compare the stent technique over double guide wire technique. That means there is a pancreatic stent or a double guide wire. Though the overall success rate is same, the pancreatic rate is much less if you do it over the put a stent. And so it is now a practice to put a stent, a short stent, inside the pancreatic duct whenever you use a double wire technique. Now finally, uh, what is Burdick's technique? So this is a technique which we sometimes find to be useful. We would do one or two cases maybe every two months. So while I'm trying to cannulate, what you'll see is that uh, I'm going with a sphincterotome. And the sphincterotome pierces the uppermost part of the papilla. So this is otherwise considered to be a complication. And most of the people will then stop the procedure at that. But what I'm doing here is that I'm cutting that papilla uh, through the pierced papilla. And then it's sort, sort of a pre-cut. Uh, and then you'll find that the papilla exposes itself and the cannulation invariably becomes very easy. And you can do whatever endotherapy you need to do. So we have found this procedure to be very useful with a very low complication rate. I'm not going to touch upon step four, which is failed cannulation to the RCP pre-cut. 
And step five, which is failed ERCP, and you look at US rendezvous, repeat procedure, pocket in years, or of course, always a choice to refer to another center. I'm supposed to talk about biliary sphincterotomy. I'll just spend half a minute to one minute on this. I think biliary sphincterotomy requires uh, further expertise. So the issues are what current? Mostly we use now endocut, which is a combination of pure cut and coagulation. Sphincterotome, any sphincterotome is good enough, but if you have a large diverticulum, sometimes using a clever cut, which has an insulated sheath over the cutting wire in the proximal part may be useful. But in general, you can get away with any sphincterotome. How much to cut? I think that's an important decision. And I'll just try to show you on these two pictures. Now in this, I think I can cut up to this point. Wherever the bulge is, sometimes there's no horizontal fold, but you can go up to the bulge. And in this, I could have cut a little more if required, but I wanted to play safe as I've cut this, but maybe I could have cut two millimeters more. But when there's a diverticulum, I will usually be a little more conservative and then dilate it without doing a balloon sphincteroplasty rather than cutting up to the end. One last point that you must understand the blood supply so there is NT in the posterior arcade supplied by gastrointestinal artery and superior mesenteric artery. What is most important, and this is an excellent study, that between 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock, the, there are minimum amount of vessels around the papilla. So when you are doing a biliary sphincterotomy, you should always orient yourself between 10 to 11 o'clock position. So the risk of post ERCV bleeding is less. So to the last slide. So these are the various steps I talked about. Standard sphincterotomy with guide wire is my step one. If there is altered anatomy, stenotic papilla, guide wire first, diverticulum, evert, post-surgical, use proper scope, step two. Step three is that if event happens, PD wire, use a double wire technique, papilla puncture, you may try a Burdick's procedure, step three, pre-cut is step four, and uh, other methods are step five. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mahesh. Uh, that was uh, very clear, very illustrative, and... Uh, there are already a lot of questions. We'll take that up during the panel discussion. Uh, I hand, it, hand the proceedings over to my co-anchor, Dr. Praveer, to conduct the proceedings and to introduce the next speaker. Over to you, Praveer. Thank you, sir. So uh, I think the next talk we have uh, Dr. Nageshwar Reddy, who again needs uh, no introduction to this audience. So I think a few words I would like to say about Dr. Reddy. He is one of the gastroenterologists to whom any gastroenterologist working in the endoscopic field looks up to. He, I would say, is a complete gastroenterologist who has set up a benchmark in academic field as well as administrative field. You need to see Asian Institute of Gastroenterology to really understand what I'm talking about. So with these words, I would like to invite Dr. Reddy for his talk on selective pancreatic cannulation and sphincterotomy. Dr. Reddy, please. At the outset, I'd like to thank the SGA Masterclass uh, Committee for giving me this opportunity to talk on selective pancreatic cannulation and sphincterotomy. In fact, uh, most of the talks, as you can see, when you talk about selective cannulation and CBD, and uh, Mahesh has just given you a nice talk on how selectively to cannulate the CBD. Now, why pancreatic duct selective cannulation is not often talked about is that either it's easy or it's too difficult. There's no intermediate between this. Now, what is the reason that we have to selectively cannulate the pancreatic duct? It's because uh, we want to do therapy for calculi, strictures, leak or fluid collection. And sometimes for diagnostic purposes like pancreatic oscopy, we rarely do manometry nowadays. So how do we access the pancreatic duct? The pancreatic duct of course is access, access to the retrograde route through ERCP. It can be a direct cannulation or it could be a wire guided cannulation which is often the preferred technique now. And of course spintrotomy can run directly for the pancreatic spintrotomy or we could do a biliary followed by pancreatic spintrotomy and I'm going to briefly show you a few videos of this. Rarely, when you can't access the pancreatic duct uh, by ERCP, we do an endoscopic ultrasound. Now, when you want to access the pancreatic duct, so if you want to go to the pancreatic duct, you have to actually selectively go to the right upper quadrant to selectively cannulate the pancreatic duct. Now, to go to the right upper quadrant, you actually have to twist your body towards the left a little so, and the scope to the left, and this automatically orients you towards the right side of the papilla. Similarly, Papillas come in different shapes and sizes and this is one of the difficulty and when you have a papilla like this what you must do is to again turn your body little to the left so that the cannula goes to the right upper quadrant of the papilla and then you can cannulate at that selective 
Now, when you look at the pancreatic ductal or pancreatico bile duct anatomy as an endoscopist, there are different grades. You can have the ducts opening separately. They can be a small common channel. They can be a significant common channel in the intraduodenal part of the duct or on rare occasions, uh, you can have an anomaly like this. This is actually the Michel's classification. The commonest one is the one which we encounter and that is where the difficulties come, the type 1 where you find a channel of about 1 centimeter, then leads to the bile duct and the pancreatic duct. Uh, rarely, if you are lucky, you can get two different openings out of the papilla, but this is extremely uncommon and still rarer is the pancreatic biliary anomalies, which we often see in children, which can result in say cholidocal cysts or other problems. Now, what should you select to cannulate the pancreatic uh, orifice? Uh, traditionally, we used to use these uh, cannulas, the straight cannulas. We still use them on certain occasions, especially the blunt-tipped hubrisky one. Uh, now, we have variations of this. But more and more, we are starting to use a spintrotome to directly cannulate, especially the dome-shaped ones. The reason for this is that anyway, to do a a spintrotomy in majority of these patients for therapeutic purposes. We rarely do a diagnostic uh, pancreaticoscopy now and therefore a spintrotome is often selected. And you can see here when you do a traditional ERCP, you are facing the papilla directly and just as soon as you put your catheter or a spintrotome, you are directly going into the pancreatic duct. To get into the CBD and again Mahesh has showed you this, you have to do certain maneuvers, bend your spintrotome and so on. So, usual access is much easier into the pancreatic duct. But if you cannot get into the pancreatic duct on first occasion, then there are a lot of problems that come. Now, when you cannulate the pancreatic duct, and this is something I wanted to show you very e e on a pictorial basis. You can see the cannula right up here in the papilla. And what you have to do at this point of time is to turn your body again towards the left, the scope towards the left orient so that your cannula actually is going to the right. It's, it's cannula or the spintotome is going to the right and orienting towards the pancreatic duct. A little right and a downward uh, orientation of the duct actually helps. So, turning your body a little to the left orientation actually helps in getting to the right part of the papillary orifice so that you can cannulate very easily. But you can see this position here, what I am doing slightly moving to the left, you can see slightly down to the left at about 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock position and then putting my spintotome in. The problem is not only as you you get inside, you can't get a deep cannulation like you do with CBD all the time and this is because of the nature of the duct. You can see here there is an alpha loop. So, I can get only up to a certain point, I can't get very deep inside because of this alpha loop and this is one of the technical problems you will have when you are trying to cannulate and you should not push your wire too much because you go to the side branches and that can create a problem. So, this is a small problem which is different from what you see with CBD. When you cut, cut open the papilla, for example, if you see the bile duct and you can easily get in, you are not getting into the pancreatic duct, you cut open, there can be problems. And one of the problems is identifying the pancreatic orifice. And you can see here that to identify the pancreatic orifice, I just to show you that sometimes we can actually spray some indigo carmine. I will get back to this video again because this is very important that you can spray some indigo carmine to see where the orifice is. And the orifice is almost always at 5 o'clock position compared to the bile duct. So, when you can get easy into the bile duct, open the bile duct, very often you will find it very difficult to see this small pancreatic orifice. And to see this small pancreatic orifice, you can blindly go at 5 o'clock position. But again, I will get back to this uh, video just to show you how this can be done. You can see when you are putting some indigo carmine, you can see very clearly the opening here. You can see now a little amount of pancreatic fluid is going in. You can see this here nicely. So, this is at 5 o'clock position and this is where the position is and you should try uh, getting in. My uh, observation is that if you do a biliary spintrotomy, it is very often difficult to get selectively into the pancreatic duct. So, you must try hard to go in without a spintrotomy and only if you can't go in, you do a biliary spintrotomy. And of course, the pancreatic duct shapes are varied. That is the reason why it may be difficult to get in. You can see it is almost not an alpha loop, but you can take an edge like this which makes it difficult to get in. Sometimes as soon as you get in, you can see a bulging like this and this is often in patients with acute recurrent pancreatitis and in this situation, the so-called Viringo seal that we described several years back, a spintrotomy gives phenomenal uh, response in terms of decreasing incidence of pancreatitis. Now, this is to illustrate that you must always use an angle guide wire when you are cannulating the pancreatitis. See this? This angle guide wire helps us to negotiate these difficult bends and very important, it also helps us not to get into the side branches to produce um, problems of pancreatitis. So, always use an angle guide wire and of course, we almost always start with the terumo wire 
in these cases. Now, how should you do a pancreatic spintrotomy? Look at this video again carefully. You see, I have a pancreatic axis, it's a large duct, but what I'm doing is I'm actually going towards about uh, 1 o'clock position. You don't have to go very laterally, better to keep at 1, 2 o'clock because laterally you have vessels. I'm using an endocut, carefully going. Some people use cutting current, but uh, you can use endocut too. And you can see I can go right at the tip here. You can go in a big papilla or a bulging papilla, I can go right at the tip. One of the advantages of pancreatic spintrotomy is the chance of perforation is much less compared to biliary spintrotomy. So you can be very liberal. So we are cut right up to the top here and we are used endocut in this point. And of course, uh, the end point is always the top of the papilla, but depends upon what you want to do in terms of therapy. In this case, there were stones. We had to remove them. We had to use a, a balloon because they are radiolucent stones. And you can see that's the reason why we made a big opening here. But it's just for putting stents or for a small diagnostic purpose, it can be much shorter. And again, in this case, you can see there's a large stone. So we cut and this is another tip that I like to give you that always use a balloon to completely open up the pancreatic, especially in chronic pancreatitis, because it's a small pre papillary structure in majority of these patients. So if you use a balloon, you can, so you do like a spintroplasty, what you do for biliary spintroplasty, not well described in the pancreas, but if you do a spintroplasty, very often you can remove these uh, structures, uh, stones very easily. Now coming to pancreas divism, of course, always a diagnosis is made by an MRCP, and uh, we're starting to use secretin enhanced MRCP in these cases. And if there is Santin or seal like here, then you know that this is obviously the cause of recurrent pancreatitis and patients again have good response to pancreatic spintrotomy. So whenever we cannulate the minor papilla, you can see notice the scope position, the long or semi-long position that we cannulate. That's how the minor papilla comes very nicely into your view. So we can we cannulate through this view and the way to get into the semi-long position is either to push the scope down as you see the major papilla so that you start coming looking up or in the long position itself, beginningly, when you go in, in the beginning, in the long position, is go, you go in. Again, my tip is I found that in difficult um, minor papilla cannulations, if you start with the long position in the beginning, instead of short convert to long, if you start with the long position, then you have a better access to the minor papilla because your direction is better. Now, minor papilla, you can see sometimes you can't see the opening very well. In these cases, we always keep a uh, small amount of secretin in our refrigerator in the endoscopy room, we inject the secretin and then you can see after a few minutes, it's one unit per kg body weight, you can see very nicely the uh, secretions coming out, you can cannulate the direction. For cannulation of uh, the minor papilla, I like to use this very special catheter, it's 543 catheter, along with this is Nova Gold wire, this Nova Gold wire has got a very nice angled uh, uh, nitinol tip, so it doesn't cause damage. Uh, to the minor papilla. So, 543 catheter with a nitinol tip. But if the opening is large, you can go with your spintrotome because it makes it easier to do a subsequent uh, spintrotomy. So, there are two ways of doing a spintrotomy in these cases. We can do a wire guided like what we do with the bile duct or we can do a stent guided uh, spintrotomy. And you can see these two in the videos here. Uh, this is a wire guided. So, we put a wire first and then do a standard spintrotomy like we do normally. Uh, but sometimes the doesn't, wire doesn't go in very well and you are hitting a side branch. In these cases, I put a very short stent. Uh, we now have four French stents which can take in the O3 tube guide wire or O3 5 guide wire. And then on the stent, we can do a uh, spintrotomy. So, this is stent guided spintrotomy. So, any of this can be done in patients with pancreas division. Oh, occasionally, rarely, your access. Uh, to the pancreatic duct uh, is not possible through the retrograde phenomena. And then what you have to do, of course, is if you have the expertise in your unit, use an endoscopic ultrasound guidance, get into the pancreatic duct. You can get the guide uh, via retrograde down into the uh, duodenum and then you can access uh, the duct. But this is not very common. Uh, so my take home messages for pancreatic duct cannulation and me are, for the main pancreatic duct, use a straight scope. For the pancreas divism, use the long scope method and use the long scope directly. Have a little leftward orientation for the main papilla. Leftward, little down sometimes helps at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock position. Always use an angled hydrophilic guide wire. This is what I like to emphasize. Always use an angled hydrophilic guide wire in the pancreas to decrease the chance of pancreatitis. And if you have a pancreas divism which is difficult, I suggest that you can get secretin is now available. You can import some and keep with you. And in a difficult case, you can use secretin to delineate the pancreatic orifice properly. Again, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Reddy, for an excellent talk.
i think we'll be taking the questions at the end so next uh, talk is by professor amit maidev who again needs no introduction to this audience uh, he has the endoscopy skills of a real master his passion for learning new techniques and that too with perfection is a quality which only very few of us can have he is an equally good teacher of endoscopic techniques it's really a pleasure to the eyes to see him performing the endoscopic procedures be it ERCP third space procedures or ESG with these words i would invite sir to talk on pre cut exostomy dr amit pandey uh, thank you so much uh, praveer and uh, i thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity we just heard uh, three fantastic talks actually first one from praveer on minimum standard reporting for ERCP very exhaustive very nice talk and of course selective cannulation of the cbd as well as the pd by mahesh as well as by nagi actually my talk is a uh, just a minor part of this whole process because as all of us know in most of the times uh, we usually succeed in uh, uh, selective cannulation of the bile duct pre cut is usually performed for biliary cannulation rather than pancreatic cannulation we rarely do a pre cut uh, for a pancreatic ductal access uh, all of us know this uh, famous saying of peter cotton that uh, for a beginner a uh, selective cannulation and doing an interventional ERCP can be difficult it can be uh, quite difficult and as you see uh, the main issue here is the uh, the ampulla of waiter because the ampulla of waiter as already told to you by mahesh and also by nagi we have to understand that the ampulla of waiter is a very special organ because number one you have to know that it is a small organ so whatever instrument you use has to be small and in addition to that it is a very delicate organ so the instrument also has to be delicate your maneuvers also have to be delicate in addition to that you can see this anatomical structure of the ampulla it is a complex organ it's not as as simple as it as it appears uh, so you see here it has got sphincters it has got so many muscle fibers and you also see that the bile duct is coursing in this particular way so therefore sometimes even in expert hands cannulating selectively in the bile duct can be difficult for example you see here from these various studies that selective cannulation of the bile duct in spite of you being an expert can have a failure rate somewhere between 5 to 15% in expert hands it may be lesser however if for a beginner it can be even higher so therefore we have to think of what to do next in case you fail to cannulate the bile duct of course nowadays you have got techniques like us guided rendezvous by which we can have a good guidance by which we can do a rendezvous technique and cannulate the bile duct but it is very important to learn this special technique which is called as a pre cut accessotomy in fact i remember at the beginning uh, 30 years back when pre cut was just being uh, developed or it was been described there was a statement made by the father of endoscopy peter cotton that pre cut is a dangerous technique and only meant for the experts but at the same time another expert in germany professor nip sohendra made another statement saying that you have to learn the pre cut because until you learn the pre cut you will never become an expert so instead of saying that pre cut is only meant for expert i think you have to master the technique of pre cut now what is the principle of pre cut accessotomy the principle of pre cut accessotomy is basically de roofing of the ampulla waiter Uh, we just heard from nagi's talk the michels classification of how the bile duct and the pancreatic duct fuse and at they both open at the ampulla waiter you see here this common channel is seen in almost 85% of the times and that is exactly the reason why sometimes we have a failure of selective cannulation inside the bile duct because the lower part of the bile duct is coursing vertically then horizontally and then vertically it is a s shaped lower part of the bile duct so in pre cut technique you have to basically incise the superficial layers of the ampulla waiter layer by layer in the axis of the bile duct until you reach the bile duct epithelium so you see here this is the part which you have to basically incise by using whichever pre cut sphincterotomy you are going to use now what is important to remember is what is the depth what is this layer whatever is this layer the maximum depth is going to be not more than 5 mm so therefore whichever knife you use 
should not be a long knife like a sword because if the knife is very long then you can do a very deep incision and thereby you can have a wrong pre cut so number 1 is de roofing of the ampulla layer by layer in the axis of the cbd with a maximum depth of 5 mm and after you have cut the layer like a surgical incision see the surgeon when he incises the abdomen he never goes directly in the peritoneum there is a skin then the superficial fascia the subcutaneous tissue then he goes to the layers so therefore layer by layer you have to incise and after every incision you have to carefully inspect in the ampulla operator search and identify the salmon pink epithelium of the bile duct and then you have to cannulate it and complete it with your sphincterotomy so now initially when pre cut was described there were two techniques and there were two sphincterotomes the one which i learned on initially was the sohendra pre cut sphincterotome and this was exactly the reason why sohendra devised this sphincterotome where the wire of the sphincterotome was almost going to the tip so the the tip of the sphincterotome was engaged in the orifice of the ampulla and then the sphincterotome was rotated in such a way by this wire was coming in towards the roof and the main advantage of using this soendra type of precast sphincterotome was that this sphincterotome did not move from one side to the other and you did not have a zigzag incision and with this cutting you could achieve a very controlled layer by layer incision of the ampulla operator now the easiest method to use this soendra type of sphincterotome and the simplest precast accessorotomy for even a beginner is to remove an impacted ampullary stone in fact this is the ideal case where you can learn the precut technique here i am using the soendra precut sphincterotome this is a video of almost 30 years back see here uh, keep the sphincterotome tip in the orifice and over the stone itself you can cut this is one situation where you can never go wrong because if you go along the stone you are always in, over the bile duct and then you have to treat the ampulla very delicately with the sphincterotome itself you give a little bit of nudge and you can deliver that impacted stone and then you can complete the sphincterotomy so this was an accessorotomy using the soendra precut sphincterotome to actually de roof the ampulla operator you see here what do i mean by layer by layer incision this is the first layer and then by using the same sphincterotome we are going to separate out the layers you see the bulging portion of the bile duct below and then again you put this sphincterotome tip in the orifice and then you start the second incision and thereby you can achieve a selective cannulation by going inside the bile duct however nowadays most of us use what is called as the needle knife sphincterotome for the precut and the commercially available needle knife sphincterotome if you see here when you project out this wire it is either 6 mm or 8 mm which is much longer than what you would like to cut so the ideal length of projected wire out of the needle knife should be either 4 mm or 5 mm by which you will not create a complication while performing a precut so now i am going to demonstrate to you how do we use the needle knife sphincterotome to perform a proper uh, precut accessorotomy so now you see here is now we have projected the needle knife out we gently going to pull it back now i am going to i want you to concentrate on this external video of mine you see here what i am going to do now after projecting the needle knife out i put it in the orifice now i am not going to hold the needle knife sphincterotome at all with my right hand i am holding the shaft of the scope and the entire cut is done by moving the shaft of the scope so i am pulling the scope backwards so and we have to make sure that while cutting it it has to be a clean incision in one particular direction and not going zig by zigzag so after the first layer is cut open now you pull the needle inside the needle knife and by using the sheath we are going to separate the layers out and you see here this is how we are separating the layers out and you look inside what you are going to observe and by looking inside now you see here that if you go too much on the left you are going to go away from the bile duct you have to cut on this bulging portion so once again we'll project the knife out and again start from this orifice and start cutting towards this direction rather than this direction because if you start cutting on the left side of this bulge then you are likely to create a perforation so the second layer is now cut and after cutting the second layer once again you start separating it out apply a little bit of a suction some point in time you may even see some bile appearing from this epithelium over here from the bile duct already the bile duct has started getting exposed some of you who are watching this video will already in your mind 
must be saying, oh, here, this is the bile duct. So this is what I'm going to do now. So gently probe it, very, very gentle. See how delicate the movements have to be. And this is exactly, so this is what you have to do. It should never be an accidental cannulation. But when you do a pre-cut, and if you master the pre-cut, what you actually achieve is a intentional cannulation. Now, you can also perform a pre-cut in a situation like this, where because of this diverticulum, you see that this ampulla is a little bit rotated. So even in this situation, you have to make sure that your cut does not go zigzag. It is going exactly at 11 o'clock on the bulge of the ampulla waiter, layer by layer incision. The superficial layer is cut here very, very gently and very, very accurately. And for that, don't hold the knife. Don't use the elevator. Hold the shaft of the scope and do the movements. You see here now the salmon pink epithelium is exposed. So put the knife inside, rotate the small wheel to the left, change the axis towards the bile duct. And this is how we enter deep inside the bile duct. Well, uh, uh, Dr. Goenka already mentioned to us that there is something also called as a trans pancreatic precut sphincterotomy where what you do is if your guide wire is repeatedly entering your pancreatic duct, uh, you can directly just put your sphincterotome in the pancreatic duct, rotate your sphincterotome in such a way by which this wire faces towards the bile duct and through this septum, we go cutting towards 11 o'clock direction and enter into the bile duct. Well, this appears to be a little bit uh, dangerous technique. However, studies have shown, you see here one randomized controlled trial which compared between transpancreatic precut sphincterotomy versus a double guide wire technique, it has shown that a transpancreatic precut sphincterotomy has got a much higher success rate than double guide wire technique. So, double guide wire technique nowadays we use only in those patients where the guide wire repeatedly enters the PD and you do not know or you are not confident of doing a transpancreatic precut. Otherwise, you should go ahead and perform a transpancreatic precut. Even in this, you see here, there is not too much incidence of post ERCP pancreatitis. Well, what is the published literature on precut? You see here, though it was initially thought that precut is a dangerous technique, now it is well believed, and most of the expert endoscopists always feel that if you perform the precut early in the stage of cannulation, instead of continuing to cannulation and entering into the PD again and again, if you perform an early precut, you see there are four meta analyses which have included six, six, seven, and seven randomized control trials, more than 4,000 patients. Early pre-cut has shown to significantly reduce the incidence of post ERCP pancreatitis, and it's a very useful technique if your conventional technique fails. In fact, the ESG clinical guidelines in 2016 have included pre-cut in their protocol. You see here, if there is no pancreatic guide wire insertion, the next step should be a pre-cut sphincterotomy, and only if there is a pre-cut which has failed, then you can consider some form of a rendezvous procedure. And even if you have an intentional pancreatic guide wire cannulation, you can either perform a trans transpancreatic biliary sphincterotomy or you can do again a normal pre-cut sphincterotomy or accessotomy by the traditional technique. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Amit. Uh, I think it can be, it cannot get clearer than this. Uh, <clears throat> So we come to the end of the formal presentations and we go on to the discussions and I've got lots of questions. Uh, myself and Dr. Prabir will be sharing the questions. First of all, I'll start by one question that has come. Uh, I think it's a, it refers to reporting, so I'll direct it to Dr. Prabir. The question is from, by Dr. Anand and he says, he's asking, how do you assess or report on the size of a stone on a cholangiogram? I think in all uh, fluoroscopy machines, we have the caliber to measure the size of the stones. So we can do that. And uh, uh, basically, the reporting of the size of stone is done by measuring it rather than empirically. Okay. So can I make a comment to Gene yes, there? Yes, my yes, Some of the earlier versions do not have that calibration. Most of the present uh, takes care of the magnification factor. And you know that what is a factor but even if you don't have that then you know the size of your diameter of your endoscope and you know that it is 13 meters from that you can interpret what is the magnification factor and interpret that what is the size of the stone i think if the, your machine does not give it directly then you can use the magnification factor happy to see nagi joining in yes hi nagi hi hi uh, nagi welcome yeah. uh, just joined right on time 
we are just starting the panel discussion uh, no, no. So the, <laughs> first uh, first of all i'll now uh, start with mahesh his his was the first talk on uh, uh, cbt cancellation uh, a question from dr sunil you mentioned about the fact that you will always prefer an angled guide wire over a straight guide wire why i think these are these are hydrophilic wires uh, gn and if you use an angled wire sometimes it finds its space fi finds its place so i think when you move the angled wire and you rotate it it tries to go in different directions and in general the angled wire the success rate has been found to be better because the straight wire has a particular direction to move in whereas angled wire when you rotate it can go into any direction with a little push okay Dr. Deepak Johnson from Tiruvalla asks, "Would you prefer a 20 millimeter or a 30 millimeter cutting wire? If which one, why?" I think mostly we use 20 millimeters uh, because if you use too long a wire, then taking the whole wire in outside the scope, there may not be enough space. So in general, most of the time we use a 20 millimeter wire. And as I said, if you use a wire which, in the presence of a diverticulum, it may be a good option to use a clever cut. so that you don't uh, cut the superior part of the diverticulum so the shorter the wire the better but are there any situations where we where we where you would prefer a 30 mm the only if there is a large bulging part or a floppy wire it's, it's really the situation okay um the next question is uh, with uh, refers to uh, the the tactile feedback now when when the resident or the person who is learning ercp goes and reads about it he is there's a mention about tactile feedback and also guide wire related feedback the tactile feedback which uh, 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 the endoscope is feeds uh, how how do you explain it and how important is it i think when you've done a large number of ercps when you enter the bile duct the feel is there that you have entered the bile duct so there's no genuine in the bile duct once you enter the bile duct there's sudden loss of resistance and then it moves very smoothly so i think that is a tactile sensation we are talking about now i must also say that there are two ways in which you can handle the guide wire one is that you can handle it yourself that some of the experts do but in my unit at least i am not very comfortable handling the guide wire myself so my technician will handle the guide wire and my job is only to manipulate the sphincter protome i know amit sometimes i have seen amit doing the guide wire manipulation himself but i think it all depends on your own practice but in general i hardly ask my technician to hand over the guide wire to me okay uh two questions before i hand it over to prabhu you have any point on that nagi your comment on that yeah so my Do i you have the guide wire yourself yeah no technician the problem is in our unit uh, if you ask the technician they feel insulted if i had to take over the guide wire so let it be <laughs> and of course i'm not as talented as amit in handling the guide wire because he had used the scope and the guide wire so sometimes it's not so easy but with the short guide wire technique that has come now especially boston started this it's become more common because in western countries the technicians are not high quality in general in india i think all over technicians are extremely high quality and in fact i remember a technician who was ramesh might know this guy in philip augustine unit who used to be 200% sure whether in bile duct or pancreatic duct even without any contrast injection just by feel he used to say here in the bile duct pancreatic doctor prabir do you have anything to add amit yeah yeah i i also agree what's important is the tactile sensation should be there even in your assistant so once your assistant comes to such a level that they themselves will tell you oh it's gone inside very easily you know that's that's very very important so if the assistant is not up to that mark then you have to handle the guide wire yourself because you can create a lot of damage with the guide wire if it is going in wrong directions and you can even perforate with the guide wire ramesh ramesh mathe philip here i think you know handling guide wire for selective cancellation is actually a very crucial step and if your technician is good you know as uh, amit and uh, uh, nagi mahesh told they will tell you yes sir you are in the bile duct even before yes. coloscopy they will tell you i think that is very important and uh, nagi is actually referring to mr appachan is actually the oldest uh, endoscopy technician and he actually blindly say you that you are in the bile duct i think yes. that is very important and uh, technician point. skill is very point can very i ask right. one question can i ask yes, one question sir. rajesh the technician says they are in the duct or they say they are in the bile duct or pancreatic duct because tactile feeling says you are in the duct is that right or 
can they predict about the bile duct without? I would say that uh, Rajesh, uh, when you enter the pancreatic duct, it doesn't go very smooth. The initial at genu, there'll be a loss, there'll be a resistance. So when you enter the bile duct, it once you have crossed the papilla, there is really a free movement, and I think most of the time uh, you can even without a guide wire, even with a sphincterotome, you can say that you have entered the bile duct or the pancreatic duct. But I think uh, I don't think that it comes with with could I, uh, Yeah, could I intervene here? Uh, of course. Uh, uh, it all depends upon the tactile dressing. I agree with Mahesh that uh, the passage of a guide wire into a pancreatic duct is not as smooth. So with experience, you can actually make out whether your uh, guide wire is in the bile duct or in the pancreatic duct. Praveer, uh, do you have any questions for Mahesh? Yeah. So uh, one of the questions again from one of the delegates, uh, he has asked uh, uh, this Deepak from Tiruvala, how safe is Transpancreatic sphincterotomy for biliary excess. Dr. Mahesh. I don't, I don't do it. I know, uh, I know Ranthi is not here, but Ranthi sometimes showed us this technique in many conferences. I am very, very scared to do a trans sphincterotomy, uh, pancreatic sphincterotomy. I think I don't know which direction I'm cutting from inside. So I would prefer to do a guide wire. If the guide wire is already inside, I would prefer to do a double guide wire technique or put a stent in the pancreatic stent. I personally, I'm very, very afraid of doing a trans trans pancreatic sphincter. Can you just add there that this was a Goff technique which Goff described initially that you can't get in then. Uh, of course, if you put in a pancreatic stent, it's supposed to be safe, but I think it's not a good technique like Mahesh said because instead of destroying one spinter, you're destroying both the spinters. I mean, you want to do a biliary spintrotomy for some reason to take out a stone, and you're cutting the pancreas, you're destroying this pancreatic spinter which can go into fibrosis stricture and so on. So, so that main reason, I think we should not try and do this technique yeah. as much as possible. Somehow, so, that randomized trial which I showed you yeah. has shown that the success rate of transpancreatic is better than double guide wire. But even even in my center, I personally don't uh, advocate to do a transpancreatic sphincterotomy. I mean, the trial showed success increase, but the trial didn't show the follow-up. I think the problem After is the follow -up. some of these patients are going to develop fibrosis and we'll have a second ERCP for pancreatic. Yes, Dr. Sood also do only in those cases where the papilla is stenotic, flat, there is no window for the needle knife papillotomy. If your wire has gone or your cannula has gone into the pancreatic duct, in those selective cases, very rarely, maybe once in two months, he does. This but is not the common. There is a message which is to go from this webinar. My own feeling is that we should discourage people from doing this. Yes. If your guide wire has accidentally entered the pancreatic duct, yes. put a stent at the end of the procedure, but go for a double wire technique. That success rate is very high. You The whole procedure is under control. Absolutely true. Uh, uh, okay, now uh, uh, we go on to the second part, second talk by Nagi and on selective pancreatic duct dilatation. And we take up a few questions on that. Uh, Nagi, question for you. Uh, you did mention in passing, negotiating the guide wire beyond the genu is often a very big challenge. Uh, you said you prefer an angled guide wire tip over a straight guide wire tip for that particular reason. Any other techniques or tips that you would like to give the younger uh, colleagues about negotiating the genu? This is where most people actually fail. Yeah. So first of all, a Terumo, and in fact, now we have shifted to 025 guide wire, not 035. So that makes a difference. It's easier to manipulate 025 in the channel. Uh, that is number one. Number two is that the manipulation, you should be in coordination sync with your technician because what happens is when the technician is getting stuck in the genu all the time and he keeps manipulating, it can go into the side brand. So what you should do is to get your spindletome up right up to the genu and then give him this space so that what happens is when you get the spindletome right up there, the angle changes a little and then even a loop goes through directly. And you'll find that even a loop which goes in then straightens up uh, by itself. Sometimes injecting small amount of contrast at that stage helps because the contrast will delineate and also will open up the duct a little. So the guide wet tends to go in a little easier. So you have answered Dr. Hassan Molahela's uh, question about what size of wire is best for pancreatic duct dilatation. Yeah. Uh, you would probably use a preferred or okay. advocate of 425. Uh, Ramesh, generally yeah. it's just 425 wires in other places also. From yes. 035 to 025. Because they have the stability and they also have more chance of manipulating it nicely. Now, what about your choice of sphincterotome for pancreatic sphincterotomy? Main versus accessory? Is it any different from today? 
no no we use the same spinter tom 2 uh, cm size wire spinter tom same as billeri uh, earlier on very early when we started doing this there were specific pancreatic spinter toms which came which used to be directed i think amit may also remember this sohendra used to make those also we used to direct it towards the right side but right now that is gone we use the same spinter tom what we use for the minor papilla of course you have the uh, special spinter toms which are the minor toms which are thinner in size for this very thin minor papilla but otherwise for minor papilla now i tend to use even the adult spinter tom the tapered one can be used tapered one can uh the next question is about finding the pancreatic duct after a biliary sphincterotomy you said it is difficult mm -hmm. now uh what would be your advice now there are situations where uh, a sphincterotomy has already been done or yes. it is just done in this particular procedure uh how then would you yeah. proceed to find the pancreatic duct so this is a important question so you get a patient already biliary sphincterotomy done you can't actually make out the uh, pancreatic orifice <laughs> but one of the things is blindly it's almost always at 5 o'clock position 5 o'clock position to the main bilion so blindly you have to probe there the second thing is don't probe with uh, uh, the spintotome itself or a catheter but have your wire diet that small, small wire outside like mahesh showed earlier for the small papilla have the wire outside and this time you must have a straight wire not an angled wire because an angled wire is difficult to manipulate there so you have a straight o25 wire coming out of your catheter and spintotome go at 5 o'clock and gently manipulate and then suddenly it slips inside uh, if it doesn't i showed you the technique of injecting some indigo carmine on top of it so you can find that area where the juice is coming out is clean and then you can actually cannulate there okay uh, the last question from my side before praveer takes over uh, you mentioned about balloon dilatation for some strictures some of yeah. these patients could be having strictures right at the beginning of the pancreatic duct uh, what sort of balloon would you adv uh, advocate and what what would be the uh, the, the process of procedure like yeah. so this is a trick that i anybody dealing with chronic calcific pancreatitis should always uh, do that in addition to the spintrotomy use a small we use a max max um, hurricane balloon or you can use a uh then the on any of the balloons which go on a guide where you can use usually the dilatation depends upon the size of the pancreatic duct and if the pancreatic duct is say 8 mm we use a 6 mm balloon not larger than the pancreatic duct uh the standard biliary balloons are used balloon biliary dilatation balloons are used there are many that are available hurricane max force and wilson cook has got some good balloons okay. all this can be used and uh, it's important that even if you think you done a good spintrotomy always do an addition a balloon spintroplasty because we find very easily that after doing that the stones can be brought out or even after eswl it's easier to get out stones using these balloons okay praveer do you have any question for uh, dr nagi yeah i think one of the question is again from the delegates kartik natarajan he has asked whether a prone position or a left lateral position is preferred should be preferred he has written for beginners i don't know whether he asked he has asked for biliary or for pancreatic but no. dr reddy can tell for both yeah. so generally uh, prone position is easier for any beginner or for even father to approach the papilla because in supine position you have to turn your body away from the screen and your screens normally are in this side so very difficult to do that and also the fluid gets uh, Uh, on top of the papilla so sometimes it's not easy to manipulate especially if some small bleed is there so prone position is better the only exception is hilar tumors if you have a hilar tumor then you open it up better in a supine position for pancreatic endotherapy also a lot of people i think amit uh, does uh, supine position a lot of people do supine position for pancreatic endotherapy but we do prone position because it's more comfortable and easier to manipulate the papilla any other question uh, yeah carry on praveer i personally feel the supine position while it gives the anatomy very well it is a stress on your cervical yeah. spine especially you don't have the monitors yeah. yeah i do all my er cps in the supine position so, I, mean, i think it also the school you know amit is sohendra school and many of us are from peter cotton school so i think uh, the missionary position we favor so praveen there were the number of other questions if you uh, if you have yeah. more questions Otherwise, I think we missed out on a few questions from the chat. No, channel. no, no, no. I'm, 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 I'm still at it. In fact, now we go on to Dr. Amit because uh, uh, about uh, the the needle knife. And this is something that uh, I think, as beginners, as well as whichever stage of training or practice you are in, this is something that is always challenging. Uh, needle knife and Amit, you you handled the talk so well. Uh, 
my question to you is uh, how do you advise or what advice would you give to a person who wants to negotiate the learning curve as far as needle knife spectroscopy is concerned i mean he may be in an independent practice he may be on a stand he a stand alone gastroenterologist obviously there are lot of challenges as far as such a practice is concerned what would be your advice how best to negotiate the learning curve well first is you have to be quite quite an expert in handling the ercp scope and your hand eye coordination has to be very stable because while doing pre cut you can't have a abnormal movement you can't have a zigzag movement other you will damage the papilla more than actually doing any benefit second thing is even if you are a beginner make sure that whatever cut you do has to be very superficial layer by layer so you have to follow the surgical principle you know so cut it layer by layer at the most what will happen while gently separating the layers you can't find the bile duct epithelium wait just stop the procedure go in again after a couple of days you will realize that the whole ampulla is opened up you can see bile coming out from certain areas extend the cut a little bit and then go ahead so you have to be very very careful my first important message i want to give to everybody all the beginners who may be watching this is handle the ampulla waiter very very delicately it's a very complex and a very small and a delicate organ you cannot be rash with ampulla waiter and if you are very delicate with ampulla then you will not have any complication you know there was a saying by surgeons stormy post operative period but the issue is the storm is created on the operation table if you don't create the storm you will not have a stormy post operative period so handle the ampulla carefully and this will not you can get over the learning curve without any difficulty but you have to master the pre cut I, once you master the pre cut you have gained complete control on selective cannulation so I, 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 can i can i have one question coming see in my center we do pre cut even now very very rarely i would say my rate is less than 5% but i know of some of the high volume centers where the rate is 20% 30% also so what do you think should be the ideal pre cut rate i would want nagi as well as amit to answer this and maybe praveer and i'll tell you one thing before nagi comes nagi one minute when we began you know i had come training by nip sohendra our pre cut rate was almost 30% but that time we did not have the hydrophilic teruma wire from the time we started using the hydrophilic teruma wire the selective cannulation success went up from 70% to almost 95% so only 2 3% of the times where we found a difficult cannulation instead of just persisting and trying to cannulate and poking with a wire go ahead and finish the pre cut and complete the procedure yeah, i agree i mean so when we started it used to be 30% but yeah. now with this good wires is coming it's become so unusual now that when you're doing a pre cut the company wants to department wants to come and see how it's being done whereas earlier it used to be almost every other case so i, I think, think with this uh, guidelines especially it become very easy now uh, amit uh, this is a very important message for youngsters i have seen youngsters who have just passed their Uh, degree and they feel pride that they do successful ERCP by doing thirty percent, thirty five percent pre cut. I don't think that's a proper learning curve we should be. I mean, at most five percent, ten percent should be what we should be looking at, and it's not very. So we should not jump into a needle knife synchrotomy uh, very soon. Uh, Amit uh, Sandeep uh, had this question to ask you, and I also probably would add to it: uh, needle knife can be done above, below, or below upwards. there are situations may you may, where you may want to do below upwards number one which is the one you prefer why when second is if you do a needle knife how do you select which is the point of first cut point of first cutting yes see i'll tell you what again surgical principle i have a surgeon so i'm talking like a surgeon surgeons usually say it is always better to go from the known to the unknown so known is what the ampullary orifice about where you puncture you don't know where you are going unless you have a nice bulging ampulla waiter the cvd is so bulging it doesn't matter you are cutting on the bulging you are going from the known to the known but if it is not so much bulging it is better to go from the ampulla start cutting it open layer see where the bulge inside is and then cut the next layer so therefore most of the people who perform the pre cut do from ampulla upwards or if it upwards but once you are an expert it doesn't matter you can cut in any way because you have got that insight 
you actually understand the anatomy of the ampulla so well that whether you cut from above downwards or below upwards, you know that you are going to go in the right direction and the right depth. That is very important. Prabir, yeah. your time. I agree with uh, Amit. Uh, I, I also cut from below upwards, uh, but uh, that GB Rao in a unit cuts from above downwards. So we actually had an argument once and then did a randomized control study from below one and above to see what. Absolutely no difference. What Whichever method you follow, depending upon the expertise, there's no difference in terms of success, in terms of also complications. The reason, why I, asked was, the yeah, the reason I, why I asked was, I, I, I watched a presentation, one of the American presentations, which said that you make a star incision first. Open it up and then see what lies below and then decide where. So this is something that probably varies from place to place, person to person. But I agree with uh, both of you. Uh, more often than not, you start from below, gradually go upwards. Or if the bulge is maximum, go into the bulge. Uh, Praveen, your questions. Uh, so uh, for Dr. Reddy, uh, sir, about uh, BLD sphincterotomy, we know that an expert, uh, you have a success rate of say more than 90-95%. So what holds for pancreatic duct cannulation? How much a success rate in expert hands or how much should we try to achieve? Anyone Dr. else? I think he's gone off the radar. I think anyone else can uh, answer. Uh, Amit or most of the times pancreatic duct cannulation is quite easy because it is a straighter pathway. The only problem is after a biliary sphincterotomy, pancreatic duct cannulation can become difficult. Number one. Number two, if there is a juxta papillary obstruction with a stone or a fibrosis or a stricture, then you may not be able to cannulate the pancreatic duct. That is the problem. But otherwise, if you go in a straighter direction, Pancreatic duct cannulation is not a problem. And in pancreatic duct cannulation, instead of directly going with guide wire, you know, sometimes it is better. We put a little bit of contrast. We see whether how the pancreatic duct is opacifying and then you put the guide wire inside. It's yeah. a little bit different from a CBD cannulation. So I'll take the question. You, Samit, I sometimes yeah. avoid the, the side branch, Ramesh. Sometimes avoid the side branches. If you're not sure of the anatomy, small, but I think it's important. I remember so I said drop, drop, just put a drop. I think it's when to keep telling our technicians, just put a drop, just a drop of contrast. Drop. I think there is another question from Gaurav Patil, uh, Dr. Amit Mayadi. How early must one try the pre cut? Is it the cannulation time or the developing edema of papilla which is important? Oh, we should not wait for edema to develop. That is for sure. So, on and I would ultimately it depends upon if you are an expert and you are doing an ERCP. I think usually you do it for around 10 minutes. Within 10 minutes or five or six times, you keep on entering the PD or not going anywhere at all. Then instead of just persisting and creating an edema, you might as well do something different. So we prefer to do a pre-cut. But that situation arises very rarely nowadays. Okay, so we don't wait for too long. Always an early pre-cut is advocated. If at all, you are going to practice a pre-cut. Uh, some more questions from the chat box and I would like uh, the responders to be as brief as possible. We have nine questions. Uh, question from Dr. Kiran and I would address that to Dr. Mahesh. How to differentiate a uniformly dilated common bile duct due to a stone or due to type 1 polydocal cyst? I think, I think this is a very good question. Sometimes in practice we have a problem whether it's because of the obstructed stone. Uh, so uh, sometimes, the, most of the time, colloidal cyst takes a fusiform form. And if you have a fusiform form, in respect of the diameter, you think more of a colloidal cyst. Now, the other way is that sometimes it, the, the doubt remains. So we'll just clear the stone, wait for some time, do a follow-up. If the bile duct still remains dilated, in spite of the obstruction being removed, then it's a colloidal cyst. But I agree, sometimes it's very difficult to differentiate. Okay. Uh, a question from Dr. Harish. Uh, uh, and I would address that to Dr. Amit. What is your opinion? I think if he refers to post cholecystectomy patient, these patients have altered anatomy and difficult scope position. How do you address these challenges? So I think it's uh, portal cavernoma cholangiopathy, possibly. Or post cholecystectomy. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know which one. Uh, okay. If Harish could be a bit more clear, send, a, send in this question again. It would be easier for us to address. Um, uh, does it matter whether your wire is in the right system or in the left system? 
to do what well once you go in go in uh, whether it's gone to the right system or left if system are, if you are managing a stone it does not matter whether you're in the right or the left but if it's a hydrocholangiocarcinoma then you must have a prefix preformed idea depending on the mrcp picture whether you want to enter the right or the left duct there you can't play but when you are managing a stone in the bile duct it does not matter whether you are in the right system or the left system okay any other questions from uh, dr praveer so there was a question praveer on uh, in the double wire technique do you complete the biliary sphincterotomy and then put a pd stent or do you put a stent and then complete the technique i generally would complete the technique and at the end put a pd stent because sometimes i found that the pd stent may interfere with your approach to the bile duct so i'll just keep the wire inside the pentrick duct complete my procedure and then at the end before we drawing the scope put the pentrick stent there was also a question on uh, on how long should the pd stent be there so and if it's a small sorry sorry yeah. carry on if it's a small stent is my usually could put can put a 3 french or a 4 french stent if you put a 3 french to a 4 french stent you usually follow up by itself it may be a good idea to do an x ray after a couple of days and if the stent persists then you go in and remove the stent but then if you have used a small stent it may not require and as i said these stents are preferably short stents which do not cross the genu if they do not cross the genu the purpose is solved and the chance of their falling back is higher and other important thing i think to emphasize my is that if you're using a standard stent to take off the bulb so that if you do should not have a bulb then take off the bulb then it falls off otherwise it causes problem yeah that's very important for any prophylactic pancreatic stent prophylactic you should always take off the flap yeah. from inside because that will create harm if you are dealing with a normal pancreas here so we can't keep a side flap in the pancreas uh the question by dr rajat and this is about the use of rotatable sphincterotome or sphincterotome with a rotatable wire does it really make uh, the procedure easier there are a huge number of types of sphinct uh, cannulas and sphincterotomes which are available in general no my answer is that you don't need to have a rotatable there are habbards cannula there are lots of things which are available but i think it's really not required yeah i'll tell you the reason here the at the ampulla beta you require micro movements and these rotatable instruments rotate suddenly they don't do micro movements that is a macro movement it suddenly rotates by few millimeters here and there you cannot have the exact position with these instruments uh dr sandeep how uh, have we run out of time or do we have some more time what do we have ramesh okay yeah. matthew there is another question to know dr nagi uh, by dr hamid what is the size of balloon you use for pancreatic uh, sphincteroplasty a uh, sphincteroplasty balloon depends upon the size of the pancreatic duct usually it's 6 mm to 10 mm between 6 and 10 mm uh, use 6 and 10 mm okay it's up to 10 yeah to 10 i think 5 minutes more 5 minutes more okay right so uh, prabir any questions from your side yeah so dr amit what is the most feared complication that you have with precut perforation But the most oh, complication of per, per, per precut is perforation. If you are not cutting on the bulge, you are cutting by the side, not finding the bile duct. But you are overconfident that oh, if I cut more, I'll get the bile duct. No, if you keep on cutting, you'll just go through the duodenal wall. Amit, uh, can I ask a question in this regard? Pardon? In this regard, can I ask a question for precut? That is, suppose the patient, uh, you know, that with uh, hilar cholangiocarcinoma or proximal. I mean, upper CBD obstruction. The CBD size is quite narrow, so precut and uh, cannulation is also difficult in those situations. The precut is it more difficult in those, or when there is a bile duct dilatation, is it better? Not necessarily dilatation. It depends upon the size of the ampulla. See, if your ampulla is flat and tiny, then precut is going to be very difficult. Then might as well pursue with a proper hydrophilic guide glide wire cannulation. But if your papilla is bulging, even if little bulge is there, you can find the layers. But in a flat, small ampulla, don't try to attempt precut. Question to Dr. Nagi. Uh, Nagi, you mentioned that the chances of perforation with a pancreatic sphincterotomy is less. Uh, yes. Well, why is it so? And second, it's commonly perceived that pancreatic sphincterotomy is more difficult than biliary sphincterotomy. Yeah. Is it true? The, the reason why this is so is because. the pancreatic splinter is surrounded by the pancreas itself 
So when you do a spintrotomy, you have to really cut across the pancreas to get a perforation. So that's very unusual. The anatomy is different compared to bile duct, how it's ending there. Uh, so this is very, very unusual. That's the reason why we can be very liberal in that sense. Uh, question to Dr. Amit and Dr. Mahesh. You are de dealing with uh, spintrotomies, needle knife. Suppose you have a situation where the patient starts bleeding. Now, this could be a smooth cut. The bleeding happens. How would you expect or how would you uh, advise uh, the endoscopist to tackle that particular problem? Well, first, first thing is while doing your cutting, if the patient starts bleeding, first of all, check the patient's blood pressure. Sometimes during your ERCP, the BP rises. If that is the case, you have to give some nitroglycerin drip or a spray. Bring the BP down. Second, if it continues to ooze, you can spray some diluted adrenaline, epinephrine on that area. Just spray with your same sphincter with that, if the bleeding comes a little bit under control, you can see it. Other option is you continue your cut, finish your cut. Usually that vessel will retract and then you do something for that bleeding spot. You can give a little bit injection at the end of your whole procedure of diluted epinephrine. So the question is, you either continue with the cut and complete the cut and then do whatever you can or you stop, you, you, you arrest the bleed somehow and then decide to continue or not. I, I would only add to this, what Amit said is perfectly all right, but if you do a lot of maneuver to stop the bleeding, I think it may be best option to stop up for the day and go back after two or three days. I think one should not have that ego that you have to complete the procedure today. And this is mainly for youngsters that if you yourself go back after two or three days, you'll find that the papilla is wanting you to cannulate it. Uh, uh, a difficult CBD cannulation, of course, you mentioned about inadvertent entry into the pancreatic duct. Now, once you, ha once you have a situation where there has been an inadvertent entry into the pancreatic duct, you put in a guide wire. Uh, do you leave the guide wire and then try to uh, enter the common bile duct or you put in a stent? When will you decide to put in a stent or when will you decide just that the guide wire is good enough? See, I answered that question, uh, GN, that I usually in practice would keep the guide wire till the end of the procedure. After I've completed my biliary work, then before I come out, I'll put a pancreatic stent. That's my usual policy. Some people do put a pancreatic stent and then go in and do the biliary procedure. But I generally feel that if you put a pancreatic stent, sometimes the end of the stent is a hindrance to you to enter the bile duct. So my personal technique is that I will complete the procedure. But before I come complete, uh, withdraw the scope, I'll put a short pancreatic stent. There's one thing here, one small added point. Inadvertent entry in the pancreatic duct, if it is just a single entry or only two times you have entered the pancreatic duct, then you don't have to leave the wire. I agree, Mahesh. But yes. if, you, if you keep on repeatedly entering the pancreatic duct, then you leave the wire Absolutely. and either put a stent and do the therapy or double guide We have in our department formed a policy that more than two entries with a guide wire try to do a guide wire over cannulation rather than, uh, rather than doing the procedure further. Uh, Praveer, anything from your yeah. side before we wind up? Yeah, so I, I think one of the delegates again has a question. Uh, so if you have a downward looking ampullary orifice, will pre-cut be the first choice? Dr. Amit, please. Not necessary. Even if it is downward, you can easily hook. You drop, open your elevator, drop your sphincterotome, engage the tip, bend your sphincterotome and elevate. By which what will happen is that downward looking entry will become upward. <clears throat> so if you follow this technique, then you can do it. But otherwise, you can do a pre-cut. I think for the interest of time, we should wind up, Sandeep. We have uh, just... just the because we, there is one question from... Yeah, yeah no, and, uh, Harish has uh, actually clarified PCC was portal cavernoma cholangiopathy. So, Amit, uh, in a PCC, there is altered anatomy. And uh, uh, how would you overcome this challenge of an altered anatomy in a PCC? But I'll tell you, in a, in a cholangiopathy, you're not going to get an altered anatomy of ampulla. In cholangiopathy, what is dangerous are choledocal varices. So there, by intervention inside the bile duct, you have to be very careful because it can bleed like mad. It can be dangerous bleeding. So therefore, doing a pre-cut in a patient who has already got a cholangiopathy, you have to be extra careful because this can bleed. Your pre-cut can also bleed. It can be vascular. But otherwise, there is no altered anatomy in a cholangiopathy as the, at the ampule of waiter. Okay. Finally, the last question and uh, from Dr. Gokul uh, to Dr. Nagi, if he, uh, uh, what is the current setting, what is the safe current setting for pancreatic sphincterotomy and why is pancreatic 
pre-cut, not often practiced. I think not much you can take that. Okay. I'll answer that question. Yeah. Current setting is same as biliary sphincterotomy. No difference. You don't have to do a pure cut technique. It's the same. You can use a normal endo cut, whatever cut you are using. Second is, uh, your question was what? On why is it that pancreatic pre-cuts are not practiced yeah. as often as? Because biliary. the course of the pancreatic duct is not as defined as the bile duct. The course of the pancreatic duct can be not be seen when you have cut the layers. Whereas the bile duct can be seen because of the bulge of the bile duct. In pancreatic duct, you may cut in a wrong direction. So unless your wire enters, so usually we never do a pancreatic pre-cut. So uh, over to Dr. Prabir for his final uh, conclusions and then uh, thereafter to Dr. Sandeep. Prabir. Yeah, uh, I think uh, we have uh, almost exhausted all the questions from the delegates and few questions which we had. I think uh, uh, we had a uh, lively session, all three experts, uh, masterly lectures. And uh, I would now uh, like to hand over to Dr. Sandeep for further. Sandeep, before you come in, uh, uh, one question which I missed, I think it is relevant, is about, there was a question on registrars assisting ERCP. Uh, should not the residents or the registrars be encouraged to assist in ERCP so that they get a feel about how things are handled? Uh, this is a practice which is not often followed because they directly jump into doing the endoscopy themselves. And this is something which a lot of training centers should adopt. What do you say, Abhi? Absolutely true. Even my, during my training with Nip Sohendra, my first job for two years was only to assist him in guide wire manipulation. Only I think before I that, the job was to clean the endoscopes. Yes, started with cleaning. Yes. So they have to, the registrars, the resident doctors have to learn assisting properly. Only then they will be able to train their assistant when they start performing themselves. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, Sandeep, I, I interjected. Over to you, Sandeep. No, no, thank you very much. Uh, it was a very lively session and I thank all the four speakers. Praveer, you are an expert too. And uh, you rightly correct, covered a lot of right parts that and I think you should now write it up as a publication for JDE as we expected in the, in the beginning. We, Dr. Goenka, who is the chief editor, he has agreed that we will publish this. I think this session was phenomenal. Like all other sessions, this has reached the crescendo uh, as we expected. And uh, I would like to thank personally all the speakers and the moderators for running fantastically. Questions from the audience was great. Uh, there are some more questions left, but we'll try to answer it later to keep the time uh, as importance. Let me remind you that uh, the next session will be in the new year 2021. We have advanced wishes to all of you, the speakers, the audience and delegates. And we also thank uh, Sun Pharma, especially Mr. Abhijit for coordinating this entire session. The next uh, level of discussion, that is episode four, will be the next level of after entering the bile duct and that is cholangioscopy. So we'll have experts, Dr. Randhir Sood, another master Ram Chandani and Dr. Saroj Sinha will be speaking different aspects of cholangioscopy. With that, I would like to conclude today's session. Thank you everybody for uh, being part of this group. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Jai Hind.